Welcome to Insights. I'm Dick Goldberg. We all know what first aid is for physical illness. But what do you do if you're witness to someone in psychological trouble? Someone you fear may be deeply depressed and even suicidal. Or someone badly abusing alcohol. Or perhaps suffering from severe anxiety. You name it. Well, the Mental Health First Aid Program is an eight-hour course offered nationwide to address these issues. It's offered to a wide variety of folks, from teachers to cops to nurses to parents. With us to share some of these ideas and tell us about the program are Dan Muxfeld and Cindy Johnson. Dan is the program manager for Journey's Mental Health First Aid Training Course. Journey is a large community mental health center in Madison, Wisconsin. Also with us is clinical social worker Cindy Johnson. She also works for Journey in the emergency services. She's been an adjunct professor at the graduate level, and she has been dedicated to presenting mental health issues to the community for over 20 years. Thanks for joining me. Thank you, Dick. It's nice to be here. So let's start at the end, not the beginning. Okay. Can you give me an example of one situation where someone attended this eight-hour course and it proved very important? or make one up so we know how it works. We had a woman who experienced benefit from it while she was taking the course. Oh. So we taught the first half, and in the second half, <clears throat> she came back and reported that at her church, there had been a woman she'd been concerned about for quite some time, and <clears throat> hadn't known how to approach her, hadn't known what to ask her, and we, uh, had taught her enough that she felt very comfortable going up and asking her just a few questions and listening and then offering her some ideas as to where she might go next in order to get some services in the community. What, what was the warning or red flags about this woman she saw? From the best I could tell, I didn't meet this woman so I, no. I, I can't say exactly, it sounds as if this woman was experiencing a great deal of anxiety Mm -hmm. and was um, very uncomfortable mm. most places that she saw this woman. And I don't know ultimately what was causing the anxiety, but this woman directed her towards some community-based mental health services Great. so that she could hopefully find some relief. Dan, as the administrator of the program, do you intend this program to help people help someone with mental health issues or direct them to help? Well, uh, Dick, the program Mental Health First Aid is really conceived as something that is like a American Red Cross health and safety program or like CPR. Mm -hmm. uh, the goal isn't to diagnose and treat, the goal is to recognize signs and symptoms and then engage people that might be in a mental health crisis or someone who might be exhibiting early signs of a mental health problem and try to gain their confidence and trust in order to ultimately guide them to professional services or self-help services that can be effective. Okay, so it's getting them to resources. Correct. Is, is the main goal. But I have a hunch as we talk more about this, we're going to find situations where maybe you get a little clinical with somebody when you can't do that, but we'll get there. What are the main or most frequent disorders that you're talking about, psychological problems? Well, it's broken down into a number of categories and it really covers the spectrum. We talk about um, depression and anxiety, um, eating disorders, substance abuse disorders, um, some of the psychotic disorders, um, bipolar disorder. So all of those are discussed. Um, and more importantly, we talk about the, the warning signs, what to look for, and to really encourage people to let go of the temptation to want to diagnose or to put somebody into one of those categories, but rather to look for what might be most concerning to either that person or to the community and to help them experience some relief. I'm a little confused. If you don't want to put people in categories, but you're explaining to people when there's an eating disorder and depression and anxiety, how can you not put them in categories? That's a great question. It's one of the things that mental health first aid, um, as a growing and learning program, has had to 
restructure the way that they've taught the course so that there is less emphasis on diagnoses. The categories are helpful simply to help us organize a way of talking about mm -hmm. them. Um, but it's easy to get tripped up on those categories as well. Um, because ultimately, as a mental health first aider, you're not going to be able to know what category somebody's falling in. But if someone's in trouble, it seems to me it's a five-minute course, not eight hours. You see they have something, something's wrong, and you say, you know, call the Community Mental Health Center. I think they could help you. Right, what do right. you need eight hours of this for? Well, a lot of it is about providing ongoing support for people in the community, decreasing the stigma is a huge part of mental health first aid and giving people enough information to feel comfortable approaching someone mm. and to not buy into a lot of the fear that's out there and give them an opportunity to recognize to what degree is this person experiencing distress and what kind of or what level of assistance do they need. Um, there are many opportunities for us in mental health first aid to talk about assessing for suicidality Mm -hmm. to help people talk about that very scary thought of wanting to kill yourself and are you having that thought mm -hmm. and if you are how can you and I get you some help right now you experience a lot of that because you work with people like that in your work don't you in the emergency services yes absolutely okay we're gonna we're gonna get to that okay and, and hopefully in detail okay if you think someone near you is suicidal um, but you mentioned an interesting thing getting comfortable talking to people about this. Yes. Why is that difficult? I think there are a lot of reasons why it's difficult, and I'm sure that um, each individual would answer that question differently, but I believe that a common theme is that people um, have heard, uh, either in the media or through um, their own interactions, things about mental health diagnoses that frighten them. Well, for themselves, I could see why they'd be frightened if they think, I've got it. Mm -hmm. But why would it frighten them and someone else? Well, part of the stigma is that people with mental illnesses are dangerous and might hurt us or are out of control and don't have the ability to mm. be in control of themselves. So you're afraid you get hurt if you say, hey, here's an idea for you, they'll bop you? Sure. Okay. And I think sometimes people also believe that if I bring it up, it's going to make it worse. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's a stigma that we need to, to get rid of as well. It doesn't make it worse? It you does say, not you seem make a little depressed, Barbara. That's not going to make Barbara more depressed? Likely not, no. Why not? Well, what we know about people who have mental health disorders is that they oftentimes want to keep it a secret. Mm -hmm. And that keeping things a secret is very stressful. Sure. And but if so, Barbara wants to keep it a secret, and you say, Barbara, you seem a little depressed, won't that really make her more depressed because now her secret is out? And she goes, oh my God, everyone can see what a mess I am. The, the, the process that we assist people in learning in mental health first aid is how to ask the question in a way that it is most likely to be received. We talk about mm. approaching the situation with an attitude of caring so mm. that mm -hmm. you can really just be a listener. So perhaps you don't ask Barbara, you know, are you depressed? Instead you say, hey, I've noticed that you've been really sad or you haven't been around a lot lately or that we don't get to experience the same things together that we used to, those kinds of questions, so that when you know more about depression, mm -hmm. you have more of an opportunity to talk to the person as a person, not as a diagnosis, and find out what's going on. And then at some point, if you think that, well, maybe this is depression, you don't jump to that conclusion as a mental health first aider. You have a chance to listen and hear what's going on for that person. Not until you have an opportunity to assess in mental health first aid do you then jump in and say, I think I've learned some things through this mental health first aid that tells me that there might be something bigger going okay. on that's little, treatable. So you're saying you're doing the diagnosis, the person who's taking your eight-hour course is by the time you've talked enough, you've figured out the diagnosis? No, not, not at all. But they have an opportunity to say, I've learned some things, and I think that this might be something that's treatable and here's how it's treated. So it's, we, re we really encourage mental health first aiders, just like you would somebody who has CPR, to not go in and play doctor when you have mm -hmm. CPR, but to come in and say, I have learned some things and these are some things I can do. Okay, let's talk about church and, and associations. We're leaving Dan uh, uh, aside for a minute because Dan is the administrator. He's the salesman that wants to get everyone into this course. And Cindy is the person who teaches it. 
And so probably most of this podcast will be with you, Cindy. I hope you don't feel too left out. Not, I don't feel left out at all, Dick. But Thank if there's you. any point Appreciate where you, you want to jump in. Though. Yeah. Okay. So you're at church or temple um, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you're having coffee after the service. And you're talking to someone who seems very anxious. Mm -hmm. You can see their eyes darting about, and they just seem very restless and you don't know them too well, but you can tell they're troubled. Mm -hmm. But you've talked to them three or four times after services. Mm -hmm. Would you be willing to have a mock conversation with me, and I'll play the anxious person and show us what you do? Oh, boy. I will or transition out of my role as a clinician and into my role as a mental health first aider, sure. Oh, yeah. is that okay? Yes, yes. Okay. So um, you've noticed it, and let's, why don't you begin with me, work on me, if you would, as you would suggest okay. your first aiders to so Dick, hi, how are you doing? Okay, okay. Yeah? Uh, yeah? I guess, yeah. Yeah, okay, well it's really good to see you. I mean, you've been somebody who's new in my life and I always look forward to seeing you. Thank you, thank you. Well, you're welcome. Wow. You're welcome. And I, um, you know, I just wanted to check in and see if you're feeling comfortable, you're new here. What do you mean, is, is something wrong? I don't know. Um, I don't know. I'm always glad to see you, and I sometimes am concerned that, that, that you're uncomfortable and wanted to check in with well, you. Well, um, yeah, I am a little uncomfortable. I'm, uh, I've always been a little uncomfortable. I feel, I don't know if I should tell you this. Okay. Well, you don't have to. I'm here if you would like to. I, I do get a little uncomfortable a lot, and I've been real uncomfortable lately. Um, yeah. Um, I, I was laid off at my job three months ago, and I just can't find another job. Oh, I'm really sorry. That's got to be really hard. It's terrible. Just terrible. Yeah, yeah. Terrible? Uh, in what way? I'm just really upset. Yeah, sure. Sure, I think a lot of people would be. I've, I've lost jobs myself. It's been really hard. It's terrible. Yeah. I didn't think it would be as terrible. So when you say it, it's more terrible than you thought it would be, mm -hmm. is there anything that that I can help you with? Is there anything how can you, that you help? need? I, I, well, it's nice. I don't know how you can help me. I don't know. I, I mean, mean unless, you have, unless you have a job. Oh, boy. Do I wish you know, I had I'm an editor. I can't find another right. editing job, and I, I, you know, I'm sitting at home. I'm, I shouldn't be telling. I just sit at home a lot. And, yeah, yeah. Well, that might be something that me, as somebody who's new in your life, can can be there for you. Maybe okay. that I can, yeah. Cut, cut, yeah. cut. Now, um... Where are you going to go from here? What are you going to try to do? Well, there's a there's a model that we use in mental health first aid called algae. So the what you and I were spending most of our time in, the L is listen non judgmentally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And the G is to give reassurance. Mm -hmm. Okay. And information. Yeah. So to say, you know, this is I don't know what I can do, but this is something I can offer. Well, aren't you headed to referring him to some mental health source? I don't know yet. Oh, really? I don't know yet. I don't know what, um, I mean, a mental health resource may be, but if we're in a spiritual community, sometimes those resources are more comfortable mm, yeah. and more like familiar. Like a minister, yeah. Right, absolutely. So, or maybe simply going out and spending more time together. The thing about providing mental health first aid is that it, it's not necessarily one event. Mm -hmm. You may spend... Uh, hours with another individual, getting to know them and offering support. Somebody may not be comfortable talking about what's going on right away. And you heard me say um, in our discussion that, in our example, that, you know, okay, if you don't want to talk now, but I'm here if you want to talk later. We talk a lot in mental health first aid about how just saying that is applying mental health mm -hmm. first aid. Because they feel cared about or someone's paying attention. Yeah. And if you get to the point where you do want to talk to somebody, well, that door has been opened. Wow. Well, isn't it, now I would assume before talking to you that most of this was about referring to people who can help you. That's and the last you, step. Okay, but you're saying being of help by being caring. Right. By listening. Right. And then there might be other resources behind, besides mental health professionals. Absolutely. And maybe all that's needed in the first aid that you're providing is to listen. Maybe that's enough, and oftentimes it is. Wow. This is different. Huh, I, I couldn't figure out what eight hours was. Now I'm beginning to see. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so let's say you see someone who is high a lot, drunk a lot. Mm -hmm. You can or they you can tell they've had too much to drink. Mm -hmm. A relative, mm -hmm. a cousin. Mm -hmm. You're at 
every six times a year you have family gatherings, and six times a year they're a little tipsy. Mm -hmm. And this cousin is a 36-year-old male stockbroker married with three kids. Mm -hmm. How do you approach this? Carefully. And we talk a lot about being um, uh, careful about the timing. So for one thing, you don't approach them when they're, when they're under the influence because um, mm. they're not going to be able to um, process with you. We do also in mental health first aid talk about some of the medical concerns that can come up in those situations. That if you are with your, I'm sorry, it was a cousin in this example? Yes. So if you're with your cousin and the cousin is drinking so much that there becomes a medical emergency, we also talk in mental health first aid about what to do if someone has drank or taken a drug and has caused themselves physical harm um, and what to do and who to call at that point as well. But for the mental health first aid and discussing the potential problem, um, especially when we're talking about substance abuse and um, how the huge stigma that goes with that, we talk a lot about taking your time, really taking time to say, I'm here to talk to you about this and um, I'm concerned. and. Um, to also talking about what to do if How a do person you, doesn't consider it to be a problem. Yes, well, uh, if they do deny, and I would assume most people say it's, it's not a problem or it's none of your business. Mm -hmm. How do you mm -hmm. handle that? Well, you leave the door open. You say, okay, I'm concerned. We don't want mental health first aiders to become interventionists. That's not the role. The role is to open the conversation and quite often Especially with substance abuse, we know that um, recovery, moving into a recovery process, happens in stages. And so for another caring human being, not a professional, to say, hey, I'm here if you do have concerns. Um, we talk a lot about how to talk about concerns without being condemning. Um, we use a lot of examples and, and even some role playing and talking mm -hmm. about um, how to help yourself avoid the stigma, not just the person you're talking what to. What do you mean by that? So if you're talking to someone who has a substance abuse disorder and you yourself have judgment about that, it's going to be important to put that behind you in order oh, to have the, the opportunity to listen non-judgmentally. That's challenging. It is challenging. Can I, can I interrupt right now to get to Dan? Of course. Dan, I think halfway through this podcast, I would like you, if you want, to give a plug nationwide. If someone's in Dubuque or in San Francisco, how they can find out about the program if they want to partake. Well, mental health first aid training uh, has been in the United States since 2008. And there are over 100,000 people who have been certified as mental health first aiders nationwide. And the class is taught in all 50 states. Uh, there, of course, are you know, more instructors and more courses offered in some parts of the country than others. But it would be, I think it would be safe to say that there is a mental health first aid training going on within an hour's drive of 98% of the people in the United States. And if you're hip enough to listen to a podcast, you know how to Google. Sure. And you Google? I would just simply Google mental health first aid. And where you will come is will be the the website for the National Council for Behavioral Health Care. They're the people who brought the training to the United States, and they're the folks that oversee and provide the trainer certification for mental health first aid. Uh, in, uh, in our uh, organization at Journey Mental Health Center, we now have seven people that have been trained to provide uh, to provide this training, and uh, this November we're sending someone who is bilingual so we can offer it to a more diverse populace. Great. But that is the case nationwide. Is it doing any good? Yeah. We nationwide really, or here? It really is doing good. Um, there have been a, n a number of studies, and of course, uh, not being an academic myself, I can't mm -hmm. cite all the references. but. Uh, we know that from research that's been done both in Australia and here in the United States, that one of the, one of the things that is very measurable is the reduction in stigma. Mm -hmm. By the information that is brought forth in the course, people really begin to understand what is, uh, you know, what really a mental health problem is and what the signs and symptoms are. 
and it kind of debunks some of the, I guess probably some of the stereotypes that have been uh, propagated in the media or in, uh, in entertainment, uh, in the entertainment industry. Okay. So that is measurable. The other thing that people have found is that in, in uh, doing research on mental health first aid training is that, um, uh, is that people who are trainers are much more comfortable in taking that first step that Cindy was talking about. Trainers or trainees? I'm ones. sorry, the mental health first aiders, right. the actual persons that have right. received the training. Uh, they're more comfortable in taking that initial step and being willing to engage because having worked with the algae mm -hmm. process, um, they feel a level of confidence right. that they, they know, didn't have They know what the they're training. doing, sure. Yeah. Let me ask you something. This, this might be my own biases. I'm sure it is. If you, you mentioned eating disorders. Mm -hmm. How about just people who overeat? My, <clears throat> you know, on the website on which this podcast is an article I have on how to get your weight to the proper level, which mm -hmm. has to do with eating the proper number of calories and exercise mm -hmm. um, and how to do that but when I see someone who's obese mm -hmm. I feel concerned for them mm -hmm. is that fair game to even talk about I, I kind of I want to say oh let me help you lose weight my article or let me whatever I mean I don't do that right. but that temptation when in, in judgment or whatever so you see someone who's super overweight mm -hmm. Do you do anything about that? Is that a fit your model? It does fit our model. Um, the, your question um, is a good one. We want to think about the individual, not only who has the obesity, but also the person who is concerned. Whether or not you approach the person is um, something you have to ask yourself. Am I comfortable doing this? How do I know this person? Is there an opportunity? Um, is this someone who I, I know well enough to do this? It's not some, I don't know that that's an issue you would want to approach a stranger on the street about. Let's go back to church and coffee and you've talked to them four or five times. They're not right. your best friend, but you see them occasionally. Right, right. So when we talk about eating disorders in mental health first aid, we talk a lot about the disorder being um, primarily an emotional disorder. So to start that conversation, to talk about um, emotions and expressing emotions, and um, if you feel comfortable enough, if you've listened long enough, and you believe the person is open to the conversation, and that might take a lot mm -hmm. of listening, mm -hmm. because as you suggested, it's true that talking to someone about obesity, you might bump into a lot of hurt and you want to be careful. So if you've listened long enough and you feel like there's enough trust and that you've been able to um, develop that kind of rapport as a mental health first aider, then you might move into offering reassurance and saying that you know that this is an emotional process and that there's recovery and that there is support and that you've learned some things through this training that you have. Those would be the, the initial steps that you would take. Would you have anywhere to refer or how would you offer help to the person who's 100 pounds overweight? It depends on, on that person and, and um, what's taken place in the conversation mm -hmm. that you've had. Mm -hmm. In the um, mental health first aid training, there's a, a book that each mental health first aider gets, and it's full of resources. It's full of national resources. Trainers across the nation also give out local resources. Mm -hmm. um, so even if you don't know um, what resource is best for that person. You Part of a mental health first aider's role might be supporting that person and making the phone call and maybe sitting with them to make the phone call to, to see who? what feels right. Oh, so whatever yeah. feels right for right. them. Weight Watchers or, or Weight a Watchers clinic is or... a great option. A clinic is a great option. Right. There are uh, mental health professionals in most major communities yes. that specialize in treating eating disorders and so, certainly compulsive overeating is is one of the eating disorders that's treated within that specialty. Okay. I think it's very important <clears throat> to talk about suicide. Yes. And if you uh, have a friend, let's say a friend, mm -hmm. who is depressed and you've heard them talking a little about sometimes I wonder if it's worth living, mm -hmm. what do you do? Well, you listen and you be genuine, of course. Um, in mental health first aid, we uh, 
we have people walk through asking the very difficult question of, are you thinking of killing yourself? How soon do you ask that question? When do you ask it? How do you bring it up? Depends, again, on the conversation. The first steps in algae is, of course, to, to assess and to listen non-judgmentally. What, what's algae stand for again? Can you give it that to me again? Oh, I'm going to have to pull you know out Dan? my cheat sheet. Well, the, the A is to assess for a risk of suicide and harm. Uh, cool. The G is give reassurance. Um, Al is Al listen, non listen non that non-judgmentally. And the E's are um, really encourage. encourage either uh, uh, professional assistance or uh, self-help and uh, other types of uh, support. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Okay, so we're back to this person mm -hmm. who is hinting fairly strongly they're thinking of suicide. If they're hinting fairly strongly, we encourage people to ask the question directly, are you thinking of killing yourself? It's, very, it's a very diff different question than are you thinking of hurting yourself? You can even ask the question, are you thinking of suicide? Those questions, those words specifically, are the words that we encourage mental health first aiders to ask. Why don't people ask that normally? Because it's, it's frightening to ask. Why? Sometimes we don't want the answer. Sometimes we're afraid that if we ask that question that it might create a suggestion. Could it? What we know is that it does not. That if someone is not thinking about suicide, asking them about it is not going to make them start thinking about it. But if someone is thinking about suicide and you ask them that question directly and they're answering you, usually what you see is a huge relief on the part of the person who has been thinking about mm. suicide. Why? Why are they relieved? It's an opportunity to talk not only about <clears throat> the thought about killing yourself, but all of the pain related mm. in thinking about it. Now, might you be thinking if, uh, if you are a um, uh, plumber, Mm -hmm. What have I gotten myself into as you talk to this person about suicide? This is for a pro. I don't know what the heck I'm doing. Right, right. And that is an important factor. For someone who's learning CPR, there's a, there is always a point that you're going to want to let the professionals take over. And certainly as a mental health first aider, there are many of those times that you're going to want to let a professional take over. When we're discussing suicide in mental health first aid, what we tell people is if that person is telling you that they are suicidal and that they have a plan, but they're not willing to get help, this is an important time to call a suicide hotline and to let the professionals then tell you what the next steps are. And if someone is telling you, not only do I have a plan, but that's right now, then you call the police because you're going to need the police to be involved. To They'll do have that to come over to that person's house and stop right. them from exactly. doing something very exactly. dangerous. And it, what if they don't have that much, but they are suicidal, they really are thinking about it, and they won't get help? You call the mental health hotline like where you work. What would you do about that? Oh, boy, at emergency services? Yeah. There's a number of things that I might do as a professional. There's a lot of assessment that would take place. Um, not only assessment, but as a clinician, there's a lot of intervention that I would put but in But you place. must call the person, or what do you, I mean, you get in touch with the person? Oh, yes, certainly. If someone were to call emergency services at Journey and say, I've got a friend who's suicidal and has a plan and isn't willing to reach out, then yes, we call. And if we don't get a response, then we, we go to them. So um, that's, we are fully mobile emergency okay. services unit. Well, it's very I, I, different than what we would expect a mental health first aider to do. I'm really glad we've had this talk because I, I do get a much better feel than what I had imagined this was about. Uh, it sounds like a very important service. It, by the way, is it something uh, clinicians should take too or just people who aren't in the field of mental health? I would say that um, clinicians would benefit, but in general they might find it a bit repetitive for yeah. what they know. Okay, okay. And again, and those people who would like to take this course, like to find out more about it, they go to, Dan? The Mental Health First Aid website. Just Google Mental Health First Aid, and it'll take you to the website, and it is very easy from that point to navigate to where uh, you can read about courses that are taking place in every state in the country. Well, Cindy Johnson and uh, Dan Muxford, thanks very much for being with us, and I hope you'll join us on the next edition of Insights.